Um, welcome everyone to this uh, last Clarin Cafe before the summer pause. Um, I'm Francesca Frontini uh, from the Clarin Eric Board of Directors. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Clarin Cafe concept, uh, it's, a, it's an informal uh, and virtual space for discussing topics that are of interest for the Clarin infrastructure. And uh, today's cafe uh, has the title, A New Clarin Resource Family for Lexical uh, Semantic uh, Change Research. If you're not familiar with the, the concept of resource families, do not uh, worry, uh, we, you will uh, soon hear about it. And uh, uh, this uh, um, cafe is also uh, organized within the framework of the resource families uh, uh, project funding. So uh, the organizers for today are all here. Uh, Barbara McGillivray from King's College uh, London. Uh, um, actually, Paula is not here today. Uh, uh, and Fahad Khan uh, from uh, CNR ILC. Um, the technical support is provided uh, by uh, David Bourdon. Uh, please keep in mind that this event is uh, recorded for disseminated purposes. Uh, and so if you have uh, uh, comments uh, and questions uh, uh, during the presentations, you can also put them in the chat box and there will be uh, a moment of discussion uh, later on. So this is the schedule for today. As I said, I we will just give a quick introduction to Clarin. For those who are not uh, uh, familiar with it, uh, uh, you're more than welcome to stay uh, and listen. But those who know already about Clarin, maybe that's a good um, moment. And do not want me here to hear me repeating the same things over and over again. It's a good moment to go and grab the coffee, uh, which uh, we uh, are talking about here. Um, so then there will be a presentation by uh, Barbara and, and Fahad introducing this new Clarin resource family, uh, a, a short break, then uh, Florentina uh, will continue uh, with a presentation and question and answering, then there will be a round table and some closing remarks. So as you've heard, um, Clarin is, is a research infrastructure that is distributed and uh, uh, to be more precise, we are now counting 70, over 70 centers in, in our network. It's composed of uh, uh, several uh, uh, members. Actually, I think it should be 23 um, because I forgot uh, to, I mean, I added Switzerland in the picture, but not uh, here to the list, uh, my bad. And uh, uh, more specifically, the three observers. These three observers, I mean, out of these three observers, um, UK has a special status because uh, uh, their observer status is partly also due to Brexit, but it's a long-standing collaboration, and we are very much uh, happy about it. And then there's a, a third-party organization in, in the US. Uh, you've heard about uh, sort of the technical um, infrastructure that enables uh, these distributed resources to become visible and usable in Clarin. Clarin is also very much uh, a knowledge uh, sharing infrastructure with a network of knowledge centers. Uh, uh, video channels uh, that uh, and this cafe will also become uh, a feature in this uh, in this channel. The digital humanities course registry for those who know uh, it, uh, uh, teaching materials, best practices, papers, etc. And uh, one of the uh, elements also of the Clarion infrastructure that is very much uh, widely used is uh, um, the resource families which are user-friendly overviews uh, per data type that uh, are available uh, on the Clarin portal. There's uh, today a number of uh, these uh, overviews uh, uh, for data corpora, lexicons, uh, uh, tools. I will not go into the details, but uh, you can see here a small um, screenshot of uh, uh, from the manually annotated corpora resource family, and you can see that it provides us a number of information as to the um, size, uh, language, and other useful information about uh, these uh, corpora. The Resource Families Project Initiative uh, will fund mini projects that can uh, be used to extend the scope of this initiative, either by creating uh, new, uh, new resource families or by extending the existing ones. And uh, today's cafe aims at presenting the results of this 
project uh, that was awarded to the organizers and that uh, and Barbara in particular and that will extend and facilitate the use in particular of uh, the resource family historical corpora. And uh, I have to say that I'm very happy that uh, their work uh, came also to create a connection, a bridge um, with uh, uh, the initiative of the Shock SSH Open Cluster Marketplace, uh, which is an initiative, a joint initiative of all the infrastructures uh, that are part of the cl EOSC Cluster of uh, Social Sciences and Humanities, among which CLARIN, and that um, Nice, there is a nice integration that you will hear about uh, between these, uh, these two uh, initiatives. And uh, having said this, uh, without further ado, I'll just hand over to the organizers for uh, the remainder of this cafe. So uh, welcome to the cafe. Um, first of all, uh, I wanna start by thanking uh, our collaborator, uh, Paola Maronju, uh, who was due to participate in this event, but had to cancel at the last minute due to a uh, family bereavement. Um, so most of the work that you're going to see uh, in the next few slides, as indeed the slides themselves, were actually carried out by uh, Paola. And so uh, I, 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 we, we want to give her a big shout out uh, for that reason. Uh, and uh, we also uh, um, want to kind of uh, thank uh, uh, Sabine Titel, who was also due to participate in this event, but uh, for um, personal reasons, uh, uh, as her commitments, wasn't able to make it. So uh, without any further ado, let's uh, move on to uh, the first slide. So um, today uh, we're going to introduce a proposal for a new Clarin resource family uh, dedicated specifically to facilitating research in lexical semantic change. So very briefly, uh, lexical semantic change is uh, the process whereby uh, words change their meanings over time. So, for instance, the Latin word beatus, which originally meant fortunate or happy, over time took on the meaning of blessed. And this was thanks uh, to the influence of Christianity. Um, so lexical semantic change uh, as uh, uh, as a field of research is relevant to very many uh, to many different areas of the humanities and the social sciences, and this is especially uh, the case for uh, di the disciplines which are interested in uh, concept drift and how concepts change over time, such as, for instance, linguistics, history, and lexicography, amongst others. So, next slide. Uh, so, let's start uh, by looking at the kinds of resources which already exist. Uh, for carrying out lexical semantic change, and in particular those which exist in uh, Clarin, uh, and in particular those which exist as Clarin resource families. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to uh, look at uh, three different kinds of uh, Clarin resource families for carrying out uh, lexical semantic change research. And these can be, these are grouped into uh, corpora, uh, lexical resources and tools. And as you can see, for under corpora, we have different kinds of uh, different varieties of a corpora, such as historical corpora, legal corpora, literary corpora. In terms of lexical resources, we have language model, le lexica, dictionaries, uh, uh, and so on. And in terms of tools, which we also consider to be resources, we have uh, corpus querying tools, uh, tools for normalization, tools for named entity recognition, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So we're going to start by uh, looking at uh, historical corpora. So this is, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the kinds of uh, uh, corpora uh, resource families which exist in Clarin. And uh, as an example of uh, uh, an historical corpora available in Clarin, we have the Latinized corpora, corpus, uh, which consists of Latin texts from the second century BC all the way up to the 21st century. And uh, so it, it includes, you can access this uh, uh, on Claren. It's available for download from Lindat. And you can also use uh, uh, online search facilities through Sketch Engine. Um, so this uh, the, the, this corpus, uh, it's a, as I said, it's a historical corpus. It, uh, it's uh, 
consists of 13.3 million tokens, and it has been annotated uh, uh, both for part of switch tags, it's been uh, sent and segmented and lemmatized, and uh, so the, the corpus itself uh, includes non-linguistic metadata on uh, things such as genre, titles of the, the separate texts, uh, century, and uh, also specific dates. Uh, next. Uh, so in addition to historical the historical corpora uh, resource family, another relevant uh, resource family for carrying out lexical semantic change research uh, is the manually annotated corpora resource family. Um, so this includes corpora which are uh, annotated for lemmas, part of speech, syntax, uh, named entities, uh, etc. And so uh, as an example here, we've chosen... Um, the semantically annotated, disambiguated uh, corpus for uh, Estonian. And uh, so this corpus is available for uh, download uh, uh, via uh, MetaShare. And uh, uh, it has, uh, um, it's been annotated for uh, for word senses. And uh, it, 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 you can see the, the, the size there on the slide. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, moving uh, from uh, moving on to the um, uh, language resource, was it language resource, uh, uh, lexical resource, uh, yeah, lexical resources, uh, resource family, uh, in, in families in Claren. Uh, and in, in particular, those which are relevant for lexical semantic change research, we have the dictionaries resource family. And here we've chosen three uh, historical Dutch dictionaries. Uh, uh, the Dictionary of Middle Dutch, Dictionary of Old Dutch, and the uh, Early Middle Dutch Dictionary, all of which could potentially be used for uh, carrying out uh, uh, lexical semantic change uh, uh, research. Uh, and all of them are available uh, on Claren. Uh, next, please. So in addition to uh, dictionaries, we also have lexica. And once again, we've chosen a, a, a Dutch example of, of a, a, a resource. Uh, so here we have elex, which is a lexical database consisting of both a one-word lexicon and a multi-word lexicon. And so this has been annotated for uh, syntactic and phonological uh, information, as well as being partially semantically annotated. And there you can see how many entries it has and how many word forms and uh, multi-word expressions uh, that uh, this resource contains. Next, please. Uh, so, and uh, in addition to uh, lexica, uh, we also have uh, conceptual resources and word lists. Uh, and these are both uh, relevant uh, resource families for carrying out lexical semantic change research. So uh, in terms of conceptual resources, uh, we have uh, resources such as the uh, Open Ancient Greek WordNet, and this is available uh, for download uh, via Ilk for Claren, and it contains uh, roughly 7,500 synsets. Uh, and uh, in terms of word list, we have resources such as the INT historical word list, which uh, consists, which contains 500,000 word forms and is once again a Dutch language resource. And again, both of these are available on uh, via Claren. Next, please. So uh, moving on to uh, language uh, models, which again are listed as uh, lexical resources on uh, uh, in uh, the, the, the Claren resource family uh, categorization scheme. So uh, as an example of uh, language models, uh, we have uh, here uh, um, the uh, ELMO embedding embeddings models uh, for seven languages. Uh, so these are contextualized, uh, these are contextual word embeddings, and uh, they have been trained on large monolingual corpora for seven languages. And so these are available in uh, the Croatian, Estonian, Finnish, Latvian, Lithuanian, Slovenian, and Swedish. And uh, as you'll see, language models are uh, very important for the, um, the work which we've been uh, um, carrying out on uh, developing workflows for uh, uh, lexical semantic change research. Next, please. So, uh, up till now, we've looked at uh, resources which are available via Claren, but of course, not every relevant resource, unfortunately, will be available uh, uh, via Claren repository. Uh, so there are 
various different kinds of resources which are relevant for uh, uh, lexical semantic change research, but which aren't currently available in Claren. These include uh, corpora, which have been annotated uh, with uh, WordNet uh, synsets. So for instance, uh, SEMCOR for uh, English, Spanish SEMCOR for Spanish, and Multi-SEMCOR Plus for English and Italian. And if you click on that link, you can see all the different uh, WordNet corpora. <laughs> or the different corpora which have been annotated uh, with WordNet sets. Next, please. Um, so as well as being, uh, as well as there being corpora annotated with uh, WordNet, uh, there also exist corpora which have been annotated with other, uh, uh, I guess you could call them semantic resources or ontologies. Uh, these include uh, BabelNet, which has been used to annotate, for instance, the Eurosense corpus. And also Wikipedia, which has been used to annotate, for instance, the semantically enriched Wikipedia corpus. Next, please. So uh, there are, more generally speaking, uh, we have uh, uh, data sets uh, which are uh, annot sense annotated. Uh, so uh, under this uh, heading, uh, we could list uh, the semi-val semi semi sense annotated data sets. Uh, and uh, these are available in English, Swedish, Latin, and German. And uh, I can also I could also cite, uh, for instance, uh, any, um, this ancient Greek uh, work, which has been carried out by Barbara et al. and also uh, Vatri et al. And here, uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see um, a, a corpus which has been uh, uh, produced or worked on by uh, Barbara and Paola, where uh, they have different target words which have been uh, annotated for uh, senses, for the, the, their, their closeness to a uh, 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 sense, um, report, re, sense, I guess, catalog. And next, please. Uh, so uh, there are also trained word embeddings from diachron diachronic corpora, and here we can cite the work of Sprunioli, uh, Sprunioli et al. Uh, in uh, producing Latin lemma embeddings, uh, and here you can see a, a nice uh, diagram uh, showing how, uh, how sacramentum, uh, the relationship of sacramentum with its closest neighbors, I think. Uh, but you can correct me on this, Barbara. <laughs> uh, and then uh, next slide, uh, we also have tools for semantic change detection. Uh, and for uh, the, the reference for this, please uh, see uh, Schleitweg et al. on the Sem Semival 2020 shared task. And there are also uh, computational lexical resources such as uh, Latin WordNet. Um, which has been developed by uh, I think various different institutes, uh, but more recently by uh, Lila, uh, University of Exeter, and uh, the University of Genova. Next, please. So uh, we also, in addition to the, the other kinds of uh, resources uh, that we've looked at, we also have uh, more structured data sets, which uh, describe uh, lexical etymologies as graphs using standard uh, etymologies. And here, uh, as an example, we have the Etymological Dictionary of Latin, which has been made available as a, a knowledge graph uh, uh, by uh, the LILA project. Next, please. So uh, I, I think you have to put all the different baubles <laughs> uh, on the screen. So, uh, so I've, get, I've can, given you a very kind of brief overview of the different kinds of resources which uh, exist out there for carrying out uh, lexical semantic change research. Many of these are available via the Claren infrastructure. However, what's missing is really a way of putting them all together in a way that makes them accessible to researchers who are interested in carrying out lexical semantic change research and who are uh, maybe don't have... Uh, the, the kind of the kind of competences for which are required for kind of I don't know writing a, a kind of script in, in Python. Uh, so we want to make lexical semantic change research uh, accessible to uh, uh, domain specialists, and uh, we want to do it by kind of somehow putting all of these different kinds of resources together. So next slide, and. 
this is was actually the the the, the reason why we we proposed this new clarin resource family for lexical semantic change research and this is going to be the topic of the rest of the presentation. And uh, for that, I hand over to Barbara. Thank you very much. And hi, everyone. Barbara McGillivray. Um, so as Farhad said, uh, we have a, a scattered set of, of resources in Clarin that are um, relevant to us for semantic change research. Just a quick recap, dictionaries can provide inventories for sense definitions that we need. Um, to decide <clears throat> and to analyze the sense evolution over time. Corpora will give us the empirical data to, uh, to, to, um, to find these instances. Sense and annotated corpora can give us both training data or validation sets for uh, evaluating um, any, any uh, methods for automatically identifying sense um, changes. Uh, lexical resources similarly to dictionaries that can provide us with the with the sense inventories algorithms for lexical semantic change detection provide us with the tools uh, to automatically detect whether a word has changed or not and in which direction and these algorithms tend to be um, based on their chronic word embeddings which um, also are a key part and and word lists so how do we bring this all together so we have spent quite a bit of time in this project uh, scoping the, the the problem and uh, and, and uh, analyzing the and surveying the state of the art. So <clears throat> we um, decided well we wanted to propose a task oriented play resource family uh, because it is oriented towards the task of lexical semantic change research and it, it needs to be cross transversal uh, so <clears throat> that kind of covers uh, various um, resources that already exist. Um, and so the idea was instead of creating a, a, a resource family that, as in a traditional resource family, we needed something more like a workflow. Um, so the workflow uh, are, are ideal for scoping processes that involve accessing sources uh, um, from different uh, places. And uh, a model for that is offered by the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Marketplace. Um, which um, was introduced earlier uh, by Francesca, which is um, uh, already available and growing. Um, so we used that model and um, and studied it to to see how it could fit our purposes. Uh, so the idea of a workflow is that it breaks down the research process into small steps that are se sequential and that are more manageable and and. I'm going to achieve uh, the ultimate goal of, of, of the resource uh, of the research and each step is linked to uh, resources that um, in the marketplace are already there so tools data uh, manuals of references um, so a few slides about the uh, open marketplace these are uh, actually were offered by Laura Babo um, who uh, leads up the editorial um, uh, board of the marketplace of which I'm, I'm, I'm a member. Um, <clears throat> uh, so you, this is what the uh, SSH open marketplace looks like. Uh, so you can uh, you can go to the to the URL and you'll you'll be you will be welcomed by for this homepage and and then you can see different uh, uh, types of resources that um, have been added. <clears throat> this for example is uh, a tool. Uh, we also have data sets, and each of these uh, resources are described, linked to the original uh, page, um, and there's a method, a rich set of metadata that um, is curated by uh, the um, editorial uh, board to, to ensure um, consistency uh, across. <clears throat> Okay, so workflows are one of the um, important, uh, most important components of the marketplace, and they were introduced um, because they are uh, they're really um, really important uh, for um, for mirroring and kind of describing different research scenarios. They sort of look like recipes uh, because they are you know a sequential lists of sets, um, and they um, they were introduced to to really help and enhance the visibility of, of, of research beyond what could be offered by the standard data sets and tools um, that were available. 
Uh, it also allows <coughs> the research project to align with best practices in the community, to get peer review and visibility, and um, to be shared in a different form than the usual article. Or um, So it provides a new way to disseminate um, the research. Uh, an example of a workflow in the marketplace is here. Uh, uh, one about creating a dictionary in TEI. So you can um, you can go to the workflow and it looks like this has five uh, simple high level steps, which can then be expanded into detail. So you build the model of the dictionary, you create a corpus for the dictionary, set up the editing environment, the publishing environment, and <coughs> provide for long term availability. This is called a corpus driven dictionary. Um, and then each step can be expanded. So, for example, step three, setting up the editing environment, is described by short text. And then and there's a series of related items which link to uh, <laughs> their home in the, in the marketplace. Um, and so this is the idea uh, that we took and tested for our purposes. So in Clarin, we don't quite have workflows in the same uh, way at the moment, although there is a, a workflow registry uh, in the in the Greek uh, uh, cl uh, Greek Clarin um, <clears throat> uh, page, uh, which uh, allows for um, allows people to uh, use language processing tools that are already integrated in the Clarin EL infrastructure. So it looks like this. Uh, so you have select function. Uh, <laughs> so for example, you could select sentence splitting and then you um, have this upload data and process. So it is a little bit similar to um, the model we just uh, we just uh, looked at, um, but it isn't available across the board in Clarin. So <clears throat> we, uh, we experimented with um, what, what a workflow for lexical semantic change research would uh, look like. Um, yeah, here are some more details about uh, the workflow in the, in the Greek uh, clarin uh, infrastructure. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you see uh, <laughs> selecting the function um, and then updating the data and processing. So, what we propose is um, workflows that are similar to the marketplace one. Uh, to be implemented in Clarin in some way, uh, of course, that's subject to Clarin strategy and, and you know the strategic decision of the Clarin board. But um, this is just our, our proposal, combining together different resource families <coughs> uh, to make them uh, usable for uh, semantic change research. <laughs> so what we uh, we thought of is uh, actually uh, looking at specific use case that would uh, help us scope the, this, um, this whole workflow idea a little bit better. <laughs> so uh, we thought um, and described six workflows for one for each of the disciplines that we uh, focus on. And what they all have in common is that um, they include lexical semantic change as a fundamental step of the research process. So we have one for lexicology. Uh, so the study of um, the uh, an element of a lexicon of a language, uh, or uh, we also have the work for, for lexicography. Uh, so um, how to update and maintain um, a dictionary for the point of view of um, adding uh, new uh, new word senses or updating existing dictionary entries with um, with a, with a, with a, Centers that have not been accounted for in the dictionary. We also have one for history. Um, history of ideas or cultural histories tend to be really uh, interested in um, semantic change as a as a as a tool um, uh, to um, investigate the evolution of concepts or a particular um, lang linguistic realization of of concepts that are. Of interest, legal uh, workflow is another one uh, that we we looked at, and NLP that's um, specifically a workflow for uh, researchers in NLP who are interested in developing new algorithms for semantic change detection. 
So let's take one, <clears throat> the lexicology one. Uh, so this is uh, how we um, outlined it. So we followed uh, the <clears throat> uh, the basic metadata information required in the marketplace. Um, and um, so this is what it looks. Imagine you have a lexicologist that wants to study the evolution of a lexicon or a le lexical item. Uh, so for example, could be <clears throat> a Latin medical uh, medical lexicon. So uh, <clears throat> Uh, because we know the lexicon changed over time, they will be uh, interested in uh, engaging with semantic uh, change research. Um, so at the moment, this research is possible, but uh, but quite difficult because of the nature of the different resources uh, needed. Uh, so uh, step one would be uh, to uh, collect uh, a corpus to reform the analysis. Um, so, of course, the corpus will need to be created according to uh, best practices, accounting for the relevant um, dimensions of variation, particularly uh, diachronic variation. Uh, <clears throat> ideally, would be there would be some minimal uh, annotation uh, with it, like less uh, lemmatization for the speech tagging. And so, in this case, uh, the resource family is relevant to this particular step. Uh, the historical corpora uh, research family and manually annotated corpora research family. Then uh, the corpus would be split into periods, into different spans, um, depending, of course, on the on the uh, periodization that is um, uh, required. Uh, and of course, there's extensive uh, research on on how to do this best. Um, and uh, this is uh, ultimately. What we'd want is uh, to determine which of the words that we are focusing on have changed their meaning and which sense, new senses they've acquired or lost uh, or undergone some other type of semantic changes. This is, uh, this is sort of the, the context. <laughs> so in this case, we have a subset of, the, of, the, um, of all the resource family we listed. So having explained, um, talked about the historical corpora and the uh, then we and the word list would have also dictionaries and lexical resources. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, as I said, we do have uh, annotated corpora and historical corpora in Clarion. So we'll be able to link to the that resource family as uh, for this first step. Uh, and then <clears throat> the corpus would be split into into diachronic spans or other dimensions of variation that we're interested in. We might be. Uh, for example, interested in selecting uh, text according to genre, say if we want to study the evolution of medical terminology over time, for example. <laughs> so that, of course, requires access to the metadata that uh, we assume is available in the corpus. And then um, following best practice in semantic change uh, detection re research, we would train with embeddings on the subcorpora that we just created. So we would um, treat the subcorpora as, as independent corpora, and then we would uh, train different type of wood embeddings, um, could be uh, contextualized or non-contextualized or static. Uh, and again, here we do have a range of resources in Clarin to, to do this for, <coughs> for a range of languages. Uh, for the case study on Latin, we've shown, uh, for example, the LEM embeddings uh, by the LILA team that uh, are being added to, to Clarin as we speak, <laughs> but they of course uh, exist um, just, um, such embeddings for, for many other languages in Clarin. Uh, here is the dot of our diachronic word embeddings. Uh, and uh, having the, trained these embeddings, uh, there would be <laughs> some work on analyzing the results of the embeddings to evaluate their quality. So here's just a little example on Latin where we trained uh, some um, static wood embedding models, and then we looked at um, the uh, neighborhood of, uh, of, for example, the word spina, uh, which uh, turned from thorn to backbone in medical Latin. And so we can see uh, the quality of the, of the embedding by looking at its neighbors and to, to, to see whether basically the semantics of, of the lemma is reflected in the neighbors. <clears throat> So you can see some uh, some medical terms appearing in the second model on the, at the bottom. Uh, okay, uh, so 
this is just an example. As I said, we've developed five other workshop workflows that we've uh, uh, we've presented in a in a in a report to Clarin. Uh, so just to sum up, we have uh, just finished the project last Friday. We prepared uh, we <clears throat> have a series of outputs, a survey of existing resources and tools that is available on Zenodo, and we plan to publish um, uh, also as an article. We also have drafted a preliminary guidelines for manual notation of word centers with a use case on Latin, again, also available on Zenodo. And, and we published the work, the six workflows that I, uh, I just outlined um, in, a, in a, <clears throat> as a separate output. And we also along the way uh, uploaded some uh, kind of uh, uploaded some new resources uh, to Clarin. <laughs> so what is next now? What well, now? now uh, the the fun starts because um, having spent all this time scoping the the state of the art and the need for such a resource family, now there will be the question how to actually implement this in practice in the Clarin infrastructure and how more generally. Uh, to consider including workflows um, in Clarin. Uh, I'd like to thank Clarin for supporting this project and funding uh, this time that was um, um, that allowed us to to work with Paula. And uh, yeah, we we um, we look forward to having a further discussion in the roundtable. Um, but for now, it's time, I believe, for a little uh, break. Unless there are any any questions that people would like to uh to ask we do have a couple of minutes before the break Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> i was gonna say uh, katrine asks why split the corpus better would be to provide the necessary metadata she also says workflows also depend on existing resources why split the corpus better would be to provide resources yes so the the metadata would be uh, absolutely needed uh, to um, to identify the kind of dimensions of variation we're interested in. Typically, in semantic change research, we're interested in change over time, and so having access to metadata about the uh, periods is is essential. And why I said split the corpus because that's normally what's done in semantic change research in NLP. You <laughs> you would train embedding models in separate portions of the corpus, diachronic portions of the corpora. And then you'd uh, you train and you trace the, the embedding for the same word across uh, the different subcorpora, having a line down typically. And then you'd be able to see um, at which point uh, an embedding changed radically from one period to the next. Um, this is, yeah, one way to do it. Um, and the workflows also depend on existing resources. Mm, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And there might be gaps. Uh, like we gaps, may not have... gaps and other things that are not available. So uh, the, my problem was when I looked at your workflow, if you would have a different resource and different language and depending on the existing resources and the purpose of your research, workflows can change. So um, I think the Challenge, the main challenge I see is how generic can you make these uh, workflows for different tasks? Because depending uh, depending on the situation in various languages or whatever, you'll have a different workflow. So uh, the, uh, the nice thing about the language resources family was there was one thing and they were all similar and the same. And if you're now uh, taking resources and steps and mm -hmm. there's new technology, how will you maintain this? How will you keep this up to date? So it's a huge task already to have a single resource, let alone uh, workflows, which uh, remain uh, sensible after a certain amount of time. So uh, I don't know whether you discussed that as well. No, a totally good, great point, um, which also hope we can uh, discuss further in the roundtable because um, it deserves more time. But yes, I mean, we we had uh, this challenge of what, which level, how high do we want to stay? Because at the very, very high level, we could have just one workflow. But if you go get specific into use cases, then you need to be really tied to ex what existing resources do we have. So, for example, 
if we want to show lexicology of Latin, then we need to have the lemmas for Latin, embeddings for Latin, the, the corpora, uh, the algorithms, and so on that may not be available for all the other, lang other languages. So yeah, thank you for the point. And Fad, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Just to say, I mean, this is why the client resource families are so useful, because um, in the workflows, we're referring to client resource families. So it, it, it doesn't matter if you're dealing with Latin or Chinese, as, as someone in the chat mentioned. Uh, we would just mention the, 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 the resource family. So if the workflow required a, a historical corpus, diachronic corpus, we would link to the diachronic corpus uh, resource family. And then you would obviously have to access that uh, that, that resource from to see if the if the um, actual resource existed for your language. So we are not going. I mean, we're not going to the really very fine level of granularity in the workflows, but we're we're trying to kind of put these things together so in a way that makes them accessible um, to 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 users. And then obviously you you can kind of as as Barbara showed, they do have workflow registries in in uh, in for instance uh, Clarin EL, and there you do have the specific tools, uh, the the specific resources, specific tools that you need to actually carry out the workflow. But we're trying to do something a little bit at a slightly higher level using the the, the client work uh, the client resource families, which if they're updated, obviously that means that our our kind of uh, our workflows are also kind of being updated. And uh, obviously, we, we want to version our workflows, so we, we want to make sure that you know we, we can, when we update them, they're kind of versioned properly. And uh, uh, and also, this is something which is already already being carried out within the, the kind of uh, umbrella of shock. So in the shock marketplace, they are already developing these workflows anyway, and they are at that kind of uh, level. I don't know if you if you've looked at, for instance, the the workflow for um, creating a dictionary in TEI, but it is at quite a high level. Um, yeah. <laughs>
one or more lexical units, but also relations among them and uh, with other concepts. So the research questions in general that we would like to address refer to the mechanisms that determine uh, semantic change and uh, linguistic innovation, and also the context, the linguistic, historical, and social cultural context um, that where this semantic change occur. So the question is if it is possible to detect a representative reason about this uh, type of complex phenomenon and uh, its context via computer assisted tools and what kinds of resources are needed to attain this goal. So for that, we uh, design a general workflow uh, starting with um, theoretical aspects of um, uh, semantic change. So considering uh, different, uh, different theoretical frameworks uh, then uh, we surveyed some NLP-based uh, uh, um, tools for uh, detecting semantic change. And the idea is to create this uh, resource um, modeling uh, via uh, linguistic linked open data formalism, uh, the results of, uh, for instance, the results of word embeddings, and to publish uh, this. So uh, the resource uh, will be at the beginning a small scale sample, but the idea is um, eventually uh, the community can contribute uh, uh, to it to enrich it uh, further. And uh, hopefully it can be used uh, for querying and reasoning about uh, semantic change using uh, this uh, LLOD based um, resource. So for the uh, theoretical part, uh, we uh, surveyed and we consider that there are two um, types of general approaches, knowledge-based and language-based. The first one with roots in uh, fields like philosophy, history of concepts and history of ideas. And uh, we found uh, interesting some of uh, COSELEC um, conceptual framework, uh, considering the relationship between concepts and reality and how they change uh, over time. They can be synchronized and change uh, together or uh, remain stable together, or they can change separately in a certain period of time. It is also interesting, uh, his concept, um, his um, a view on concepts as um, containing the multi-layered uh, temporal structures with elements that uh, ties that tie with uh, past events uh, present but also with expectations for the future and um, there is uh, interesting as well um, this consideration about um, the temporal structure of the sources that can be used for semantic change and uh, I think it is a rich variety of sources that can be used and should be used for this uh, uh, complex uh, phenomenon. And uh, from a temporal point of view, there are sources intended for uh, instant use, like uh, letters or speeches or newspapers. There are sources um, that uh, constitute um, normative documents that uh, have a gradual development and are supposed to um, be uh, periodically updated like uh, lexicons, uh, handbook dictionaries or encyclopedias and um, unchanging forms uh, with reference to classical texts that are supposed to convey uh, timeless values. There um, are also other approaches uh, from the language-based um, side with uh, roots in the domains of lexical semantics, historical linguistics, or discourse historical analysis. And here we can refer to um, lexical semantics and the mechanisms uh, of semantic change from a semasiological perspective when uh, innovation actually um, refers to endowing existing words or terms with new meanings or on a masiological uh, perspective when actually uh, concepts are um, coupled with words in a way that it is not yet part of um, lexical inventories. And uh, we can also think of combined approach approaches, uh, referring back to uh, cultural history, when language, language is understood as an uh, agent, but also an indicator of change, and uh, that can both uh, 
tapes and uh, registers the uh, process of change. The question is how to capture um, this uh, kind of um, rich um, um, environment and uh, context and the interaction between conceptual and social or, or historical uh, cultural changes. And uh, we thought that um, the idea would be to combine corpora as a reflection of uh, reality and dictionaries as normative resources in uh, modeling semantic trends, as I will show um, in a minute. So we also considered uh, NLP approaches, um, starting uh, from the distributional hypothesis. And uh, um, here are the word embedding uh, techniques for learning the vector representations of words uh, from their um, occurrences in uh, different uh, contexts and their distributions in text. And uh, according to Hoffman's survey, there are different categories. Um, so static word embeddings where words are representing as single vectors, uh, not taking into account uh, some aspects like uh, polysemy. Words um, as vectors uh, varying across linguistic or extra linguistic um, contexts, which uh, are actually referring to more complex techniques um, of word embedding. So we also surveyed some other approaches related to topic modeling and the Latin directly allocation, um, which was used as an element of comparison, but also uh, as a basis for further extensions like a Bayesian model of sense change or topics over time LDA or hierarchical Dirichlet process. For the uh, modeling part of, um, so we are supposing to uh, work uh, with an NLP process and then uh, to use the results to model, uh, to represent semantic change uh, via certain formalisms. So we uh, used uh, linguistic linked open data for uh, its uh, flexibility and also the um, interoperability properties and uh, the possibilities of using uh, fair uh, data. And in particular, uh, we uh, will work with um, some um, models, the Ontolex uh, Lemon and its extension uh, frequency attestation and corpus information modules, which allows us uh, to integrate uh, lexical resources with uh, results from uh, corpora processing. And uh, also uh, we are thinking to integrate other kind of information um, for processing etymological aspects, um, again, with some extensions of the ontolex lemon. Other models um, can be used as well uh, based on the web ontology language um, for uh, taking into account uh, uh, the temporal dimensions of uh, the phenomenon that we are studying. So for the uh, preliminary experiments, for the first phase, uh, the exploratory phase, we used um, a core um, collection of uh, diachronic corpora. As you can see, uh, we cover different uh, languages and different time span from, from ancient time to uh, present days, and uh, as well several uh, types of genres from literature, religion, philosophy, also, uh, but also newspaper or sciences. And um, the corpora actually um, also have uh, had different formats and uh, some of them were lemmatized or tagged with part of speech. Uh, some of them were in an XML uh, format and uh, um, also including a sort of um, complex hierarchy of folders. So it was uh, some kind of a uh, heterogeneous uh, set um, of data that we had for our um, project. So what uh, we uh, did in this uh, first um, phase, so actually uh, we applied um, static uh, diachronic word embedding. Uh, we applied fast text for uh, Latin and Lithuanian with uh, some uh, reports uh, that uh, this uh, 
type of um, algorithm works better for these languages. And we applied uh, the, the standard word to vec for French and Scribble. Uh, we produced uh, the, the vectors, the models, and then we queried uh, the model for certain target um, words, actually considering different, um, different semantic fields like um, cultural uh, elements or um, terms related to everyday life or terms related to uh, society or abstract terms like uh, democracy or revolution or something like this. And um, we applied um, cosine similarity to um, produce the list of uh, most uh, uh, or closest or most similar uh, neighbors for uh, the world that uh, uh, we uh, queried uh, the models for. And uh, we have here some examples for Latin. So it was the, the word uh, Vivitas, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, who moved uh, from uh, a sense related to citizen, citizenship to um, a city. As you can observe, um, we also uh, cut uh, the uh, corpora into slices, into time slices. We have for some, we have uh, centuries, for some we have smaller um, slices. So there were also for uh, Lithuanian, uh, some evolution that was observed for the uh, word ponas from a context uh, related to um, um, reference to rich person or a religious context to um, more um, to a sense of closer, closer to independent person or a master. For the word uh, revolution in French, uh, we observed, uh, we uh, did um, qualitative analysis of the results and uh, an alignment with uh, ortholang senses. And we observed that actually the neighbors indicated some senses uh, for each period uh, that were related to different senses. Uh, some, uh, for instance, from mechanics, motion of a body around an axis, or a geometrical sense, motion of a figure, or other senses uh, related to uh, natural phenomena or uh, to political and historical uh, change. Then uh, we had also in Hebrew uh, responsa for evolution, again, um, a movement from a context related to a religious context, uh, some uh, drop in the frequency use, and then um, different context where the word uh, was used, uh, like uh, war and tragedy and uh, close to present time uh, with reference to industrial medical ideological uh, revolution. So the idea is also to um, model the results. So to model uh, what we uh, got from uh, our word embeddings using uh, formalism. Uh, linguistic uh, linked open data uh, formalism, the ontolex frac, that allows us to create, uh, for instance, a lexical entry for evolution, uh, to link it to the uh, various uh, senses uh, in a dictionary, and uh, to uh, reference a subject, for instance, uh, in mechanics or geometry or um, geology, something like this. Uh, to model uh, the definitions in the dictionary, but also the attestation time and uh, to provide some citations and sources uh, from a dictionary when uh, the term was first um, attested uh, in that resource. We can also link uh, the canonical form and uh, for a certain part of speech to the other, to other uh, senses in the dictionary, but we can also integrate uh, the results of uh, uh, the corpus um, processing, for instance, via diachronic word embedding, and store uh, the some description of the method, like word to vec, uh, the list of neighbors, uh, and some additional uh, information, like quotations extracting, extracted from different uh, documents, with uh, the uh, and some meta uh, data about uh, the publication time or the publisher or um, more general information also about the corpus, uh, who was the creator, for instance, uh, in one of, of the cases, it was the uh, National uh, Library of Luxembourg and uh, references to uh, the time span 
and other uh, types of statistics, the total word count. And uh, some uh, relations can be also modeled with other languages like etymological uh, relations, uh, linking, for instance, uh, revolution in French to uh, revolutio in uh, Latin or with translations uh, in other languages uh, that uh, we have in our uh, collection. So the idea is to have this aggregation and uh, to, uh, think, to think of a certain uh, resource aggregator that uh, where we, uh, we put together, we integrate uh, different kinds of resources like uh, dictionary attestations with, um, with uh, evidence collected from corpora. And for instance, uh, we can uh, have uh, then a query and possibly, hopefully, uh, reasoning on this kind of resource. Uh, we can have a timeline and different terms in different languages, which are uh, coded here with different colors. Uh, we have the different points where the uh, senses of a term or uh, the senses are uh, attested by the dictionary, but in between uh, we can have this uh, corpus evidence. And uh, if we move uh, the slider uh, symbolically, um, the red uh, slider, we can uh, have some kind of a transversal view of um, how the uh, the concept uh, was used in different uh, corpora at different uh, period of times of time and also having some kind of contextualization if we want to know more about the resources uh, where from where this uh, the citation uh, is extracted and uh, so on to have this kind of contextualization in time and space um, and a more um, rich uh, maybe uh, a view on the phenomenon of, uh, of the semantic change. So um, about the lessons learned uh, until now, so we are now finalizing the exploratory, the baseline uh, phase with this testing of uh, static diachronic word embedding and identifying the uh, possible way of modeling uh, our results. And uh, the main challenges actually that we had to face was the heterogeneity of the data sets that uh, we consider for analysis. And as it was mentioned before, so we actually um, design a sort of minimalist workflow at the general level and uh, allowed for a certain uh, flexibility for the intermediary uh, uh, steps and uh, for the teams actually to uh, work to have this uh, kind of freedom based on the specificity of the data set. But we also conceive some kind of convergence po point uh, to have this basis of comparison and uh, to be able to attain the goals of the, of the project. And uh, now we are moving to a more advanced stage where um, we are planning to harmonize a bit uh, uh, more the um, the approach and uh, we are thinking to apply uh, contextualized dynamic word sense embeddings and to evaluate the results to compare with the baseline uh, phase and also to uh, finalize uh, the definition of the set of multilingual terms that we want to have for all the languages uh, to put together in uh, the resource in the data set that we uh, would like to create the ontological, the diachronic ontology model uh, via LLD. And uh, as a conclusion, so um, our idea was to combine uh, NLP approaches with uh, LLOD formalisms and uh, to, com to combine as well a dictionary uh, based attestations or not only dictionary, but attestation coming from these normative documents with uh, corpus evidence and uh, to um, have this uh, possibility to integrate attestation uh, from dictionary with corpus information, to have an interconnections uh, between uh, language uh, represented by uh, these uh, normative documents and possibly the reality change that are, is symbolically represented by the corpora from uh, the real, real world and this uh, connection across languages through etymological and translations, uh, translation relations. And as well, this metadata, which are very important to have 
a more uh, contextualized uh, environment and uh, that allows us to trace maybe also the circulation of knowledge across uh, time and space and to contextualize uh, the uh, semantic change. So for the implementation, we uh, are working on this uh, LLOD formalisms and formalism and uh, also considering some uh, starting point like uh, the binary and uh, periodically updated version of Wiktionary in linked data format and BabelNet, um, we will uh, consider it as well. So for the exchanges, so uh, we uh, hope that uh, so our ex experience exchanges will continue with uh, with our team members, which are also involved uh, in the nuclear resource family project and uh, with uh, our uh, project uh, within the Nexus uh, use case. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes more questions just for Florentina, but then uh, we we wanted to have um, a more general discussion about the event um, for the roundtable and have prepared some questions. But any any specific questions for Florentina? There is a question by Katrin in the, in the chat. I think maybe Katrin, you, you want to open the microphone and ask directly. Yes, it's a great presentation i like the combination of the trying out of a corpus uh, material and dictionaries i have one general comment as a historical lexicographer and uh, that the opposition between uh, saying uh, normative and the real world using dictionaries and uh, corpus information is an unfortunate one I would, uh, um, I think a lot of my colleagues would be insulted uh, if, if I look at Dutch, because uh, a part of our historical scholarly dictionaries are corpus based, so they're not normative, they're descriptive. So I understand there's structured information processed by a lexicographer put in dictionaries, some of the, especially historical dictionaries, are based on whether it's a corpus of snippets or an electronic corpus, so I would not formulate it like that. It doesn't mean that I don't like the combination of historical dictionaries and having more digital material and combining it and adding more attestations and more evidence from electronic corpora, especially since in the past uh, decades there's a lot been digitized and annotated, etc. But don't uh, I would not call them normative or an opposition between the real world and the dictionary world. As a lexicographer, <laughs> I think, and I think it would it would, would not be um, very tactical because the project is nice, but it's not really very accurate in my honest opinion. So that was a general remark. If I would slightly reformulate it and then say the same things and do the same things, but not say doing the opposition normative versus the real world, um, that is. Yeah, it's simply not the case uh, for uh, uh, the majority of large scholarly dictionaries. They are corpus based or, but they may be old or they need to be updated or there's new material which can add and whatever. So I would formulate it slightly different. That was one comment. I'm not sure whether you want to react to that, but. Uh... Yes, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, yes, actually, what I wanted to say, it was not, of course, to put them in opposition. Of course, the dictionaries are also based on uh, corpora uh, when uh, they are, uh, the lexicographers are uh, actually listing uh, the, uh, the, the canonical forms and uh, providing also attestation, uh, attestation examples. But what I wanted to say, it was uh, that uh, dictionaries can provide us with some kind of information about when uh, the, uh, a certain term or a certain concept was uh, first attested. And then we can have this uh, kind of corpora that we are using uh, in between to have uh, examples of usages, of usage of how certain terms are, are uh, used, not in dictionary because there are different resources and uh, to compare um, to have this uh, uh, timeline uh, and the slider going between these points of reference. So it is what I wanted to, to say uh, about this. But thank you for your comments. So it was not to, uh, to have this uh, um, yeah, opposition. 
Exactly, yeah. but it depends on the language and the type of dictionaries you use. Some dictionaries will just uh, uh, summarize and give an ordered attestation. Other dictionaries will give uh, attestations to uh, illustrate the usage over time. So in our Dutch historical dictionaries, we'll have uh, a lot of attestations already as uh, one form of corpus attestation, which is more than only saying this is the oldest attestation and there's, these are the meanings. There are attestations that uh, illustrate, uh, but of course it's never enough. It would. It, the nice thing about this is that you can link dictionaries and existing descriptions and analysis with new and larger corpora and see whether uh, what has been described in dictionaries as uh, a change of a concept through time and meaning, whether uh, this is valid or uh, or there's more information or less. So I like the combination, but I would, yeah, rephrase it a little bit uh, because yeah, it's sure. like me. And I had one other question because I really like the idea of the slide you're just showing, but as a lexicographer, a historical lexicographer by uh, using corporate, et cetera, I would very much like to have then this slider and then being able to go from the slider to the actual data, which it is based on. Did you foresee something like that as well? Because usually you get uh, corpora and word embeddings and then you get a, 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 a a graph and uh, and as a as a linguist and lexicographer if you if i want to look at semantic change like that i would then would like to see i don't understand where this is coming from can i go from i would like to click on uh, one of the nodes and then go to the data and see what is actually there and my critical <laughs> view on the interpretation the tool has done to do this image did you foresee such a functionality or uh, what these yeah things? actually this is a symbolic represent uh, representation of this concept to have these nodes as attestation points uh, since uh, one of the for instance in uh, if language one is French we have a uh, sense number one of revolution which was attested in uh, the cent uh, I don't know in uh, 1786 or something like that. Uh, by a certain dictionary and uh, we have some uh, attestation sources and citations there but we can have this slider the idea is that we can move uh, between these attestation points and look transversely for instance i would look uh, here between this point and this point in french uh, to see what I, I have in the corpus what i obtain from my uh, word embeddings and what corpus evidence I have in this period, but also I can uh, look uh, in another language what I have in my corpus, if it is available in that corpus, what I have in that period, what kind of uh, corpus usage, because maybe uh, not all the, the occurrences or not all terms are attested by dictionaries. It is the case that we observed. Uh, there was some, uh, some term like Bledolin that uh, we used in a, a Luxembourgish uh, document in French, but it was not attested uh, anywhere. So in that period, in that, that time slice, the question is, um, so we can go deeper and investigate the case and see what, what happened with this term. It was a new term, it was an invention. It was uh, only just uh, circulating in a restricted area, only in the Luxembourgish area. We don't know. So uh, it was uh, so the slider is, of course, this idea to have a transversal uh, look into different corpora and uh, that can be in, uh, in between uh, the attestation points and see what the corpora as, are actually saying about the usage of certain terms, mm -hmm. if they are tested or not. And maybe we can see how uh, some uh, were emerging or some were disappearing, just uh, moving like this. So the representation is a symbolic one uh, at the moment. It, it's so. not, a tool, not a tool actually producing this slider based on your data. No, 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 no. It was just, uh, just uh, to symbolize our concept, okay. our idea. Okay. The next thing I would like to have is this tool based on this yeah. data, <laughs> presenting that and then uh, then, uh, yeah, okay, I understand. Thank yeah. you. So maybe in the next step, yes, we will have also a tool, uh, you can, uh, yeah. interactive tool, so clickable tool, you can click on that and have the exactly. different, so this will be great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. thank you. Sure. Yeah, I guess, sorry, may I say, I guess such a tool will require um, either manually or automatically sent annotated data set. And um, yeah, we, we surveyed that there are 
few, but historical ones are really, really few and very small. So um, yeah, I can see the challenges. Uh, okay, we've prepared some of the questions for the round table. Um, just maybe uh, we'll just share my screen one more time to show the questions and open up um, discussion. And I also can um, paste them in the chat. But these are the questions that um, we had prepared and sort of I've updated as um, during this event uh, based on, so on the discussion that we've had. So would such a resource, the one that we described, be useful to you? Um, that's one thing uh, that, you know, the basic question, if the answer is no, then we can all go home. Um, hopefully uh, the answer will be yes in some cases. And we're so very particularly keen to hear from humanities researchers or anyone else you know, who, who uses it for whom semantic change researchers are a mean to an end. Uh, and then more, more technically, uh, can be uh, uh, Social Sciences Humanities Open Marketplace workflow provide a model for clarion resource farming? That's more of a clarion internal question. And how would they be implemented? Uh, what are that, which adjustments are needed? Is, of course, something we'll have to figure out over the next months. Um, how detailed should the set workflows be? That's a question that we touched on earlier. And how to ensure workflows are maintained as uh, resource families are updated. That's also something that came up earlier. Uh, but of course, feel free to um, add more uh, to your, to the discussion. And uh, yeah, <laughs> also, um, um, so th there's also uh, Alex Koenig, uh, who is collect connected online from the Clarin uh, technical team, who can uh, um, integrate and <laughs> add uh, to it. So uh, maybe I give a try to. Um, Okay, I leave the first to the audience. Um, so I, I think uh, also from previous interactions that uh, there's, I mean, in principle, there's no need to reinvent the wheel and wheel and uh, that the uh, Claring being also quite active in maintaining the shock uh, open marketplace. We were very much want to promote also the use of uh, these uh, workflow tools um, uh, also within our, our community. Uh, maybe uh, considering uh, also the implementation of them and the level of uh, of uh, specificity, the the, uh, the detail that they should have, uh, I would like to remind to remind uh, that uh, to tell the audience that uh, Clarin also has, uh, of course, other interoperability frameworks. For instance, uh, the Clarin Switchboard. So, if uh, things uh, could, uh, as also Kathleen has. Uh, um, uh, express the wish for uh, if tools can be implemented that uh, would provide uh, like a visualization or an access for a semantically annotated corpora that are of course uh, uh, conceived in a certain way then uh, we could use other frameworks within Clarence so I, I think that uh, keep it, keeping it uh, a little bit generic and um, uh, not going into all the details. So it's not something like you click a button and it will work. Uh, it, it is, I think, the right level uh, for this exercise. Um, knowing also that on the other hand, end of the spectrum, we also have this network of uh, uh, knowledge centers for the various languages, uh, some of which include expertise on these to topics. And uh, I think that Katrin's uh, center also is one of them. So it would be good to be able to connect all these aspects. And I just come from an, a meeting on where we, we were discussing of various implementations uh, of various improvements in the Claring website and in particular in the resource families pages where you can point to other aspects of the Claring infrastructure. So uh, also this would, in my opinion, facilitate making the right connections. And uh, yeah. As to the maintenance, of course, it is up to the Clarin community to collaborate. But uh, so, the, the, of course, the people who develop the certain resource family are kind of, uh, uh, we hope that they will continue helping us, but uh, anyone can contribute. Uh, and also it is up to the uh, resource, uh, the people who deposit resources in the Clarin centers also to, and to the people from the centers to make sure that uh, uh, as new resources enter, our ecosystem, they are rightly duly recorded, but maybe then I'll hand over to quickly to Alex. 
Yeah, I can, can say some, some more technical things maybe. So I'm involved with the resource families and also with the SSH Open Marketplace. So um, I know a bit at least about the technical things. So at the moment, the marketplace is um, uh, is getting the resource families from, from, from Claren and also the switchboard that Francesca mentioned. So these two are basically sources for the marketplace and they're regularly updated. So there's, there's, there's an automatic mechanism that I actually don't know how often, but at regular intervals looks at the, at the Claren side and then updates the stuff in the marketplace. And um, yeah, um, I think that, for example, if, uh, as Francesca said, there's no need to reinvent the view. Maybe it's just a good place. The marketplace is a good place to, to just maintain these workflows there. And then if you want to display them also on with the other resource families, uh, the marketplace has an API. So I think that's not so hard to get the data from the marketplace and display them together with the other resource families. That's something that I need to be investigated. And then I would probably need to program a little bit, but I don't think it's it's like out of this world. So I think something that definitely can be done. That's how I would look at that. And then of course the maintenance, the the, the curation, that's something that we have for the other resource families as well. And this, we have discussions at the moment uh, internally in Claren, how we want to do this. And we hopefully find some, some we have some ideas and we'll communicate them once they're a bit more, more concrete. I think Lorella, uh, yeah, wanted to. I don't. I, um, unless Barbara, you want to react to this uh, quickly? No, no, no. I was just keen to hear what Lorella and Father. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, the presentations. This is a very super interesting uh, event. Um, so I wanted to just say something very quickly about the question: How detailed should such workflows be? Uh, which I think uh, at some level also ties in with the earlier question about how generalizable are these workflows in the first place. And perhaps I can share a few words about uh, the project I'm working on at the moment. Well, at the moment for the past uh, almost four years, but uh, yeah, let's say currently, um, which is a, a, a DARPA, which is a project that is developing software uh, for, um, in a way, uh, creating um, workflows, but also actually dealing with workflows that can be interoperable and generalizable. Um, so the way we approach the topic, and we've been thinking about this uh, uh, actually not at all easy uh, question and issue for quite a while. And we found out that for, let's say, a computational perspective, perhaps uh, an efficient way to approach this question is to think of a workflow um, as a series of input and output data. And basically what the researcher describes is what happens to, to the data. So uh, whatever you do something with your data, right? So whatever you transform and manipulate your data, that would be one, what we call a workflow step. Um, so this uh, basically can be, um, uh, Basically, uh, each workflow can be as detailed as you can, as you as you want, as the researcher wants. But the, the difference in thinking about this, one thing is to say, yeah, I collected uh, the data and uh, I put them on a table, and then I sorted uh, the table according to to date, and then I created a filter. This could be, you know, one big chunk that explains what you did. Because, per, for example, you just did it uh, in I don't know in a few steps. But actually, from a data perspective, these enormously manipulated and changed your data, right? You actually have to break this uh, step into many steps, many, uh, let's say, smaller steps. And this forced us to think every time uh, about more from the data perspective rather than from, from the, the, let's say, what I want to achieve with that particular uh, manipulation that I'm doing. Um, and the results were really interesting when uh, we started to think about our own past workflows in these terms, it turned out that, uh, in fact, uh, at least 80% of these passages were, in fact, uh, uh, shared across uh, uh, a wide range of workflows, um, because it's uh, much harder to just uh, generalize a workflow if you start from a research question, because the research question might be super specific to your field, to your 
agenda, to your expertise, uh, even to your data site, to, to your data set. But actually, what you do with your data, especially for digital humanities scholars, this is very similar across uh, many researchers. So this allowed us to create Mo uh, uh, modules, as we call them in the software, that are in fact uh, very generalizable because at the end of the day, when you tokenize, for example, just to, to take something very, very, very basic, right? When you tokenize, you just tokenize. Uh, and this is uh, detached from your research question, right? So, so this allowed us to think about the workflow most, more as a data management orchestration point of view rather than a merely research question-based workflow. So I hope this helps. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Super helpful in taking notes. And Farhad? So actually, uh, this, I just wanted to also uh, add to the uh, Lorella, Lorella said, uh, which is that while we were uh, working on these uh, workflows, separate workflows, we, we noticed that there was a lot of subtasks in common. And uh, actually, one of the the ideas was was to have like little sub uh, so have like your workflow, and then you this could be broken up into like separate steps, which were and some of these steps were shared amongst uh, different workflows. Um, and my my kind of more general question is also for for Alexander. It's um, so we noticed that when you were kind of when you uh, when it came to actually publishing these workflows or creating these workflows on the platform. Um, if you wanted to link to or uh, refer to uh, a, a resource, uh, it, you could only refer to something that was within the, the kind of short marketplace, um, or it, it was kind of, uh, it had to be another uh, resource on the short marketplace. So um, because in our in our kind of workflows, we're, we're referring to uh, different uh, client resource families. We, I think we, we contacted Laura, I think you were also in the CC. Uh, about the, the the possibility of actually uh, having all of these different resource families on uh, in the short marketplace, uh, and and I, I think Laura's response was that uh, actually they're already there, uh, some uh, most of them or a lot of them are already there, but they're there as facets of uh, in the in the kind of search uh, search bar. Uh, I don't think they're actually there uh, as, no, uh, no. as resources. So we couldn't so, find. Them. So. Um... Yeah, maybe I can can clarify this. So the resource families um, are partly in the marketplace. They're not all there because we had some technical issues that I think are basically solved now. So um, I have to, to check with Laura what the time frame is, but we hope that within the next weeks they should all be there. And then each item in the resource family should be its own entry in the marketplace. So at the moment, I think only the corpora families are there. And they should all be there, even though some of them might look a bit broken because of this technical issue that we had. Um, and the tools and the lexical resources, they are for, yeah, basically they were overlooked by, by this uh, algorithm, by this, this program that we used to ingest them. Um, but they will come. So within the next couple of weeks, um, hopefully soon. <laughs> And that was my because I, I, I could only I tried to look for some of them, so maybe I was looking for the ones yeah. that uploaded. Yeah, yeah, probably. Facets. So there are some that are available as, as facets. So if you click on the facet, you get, you get to see all yeah, the, the facet. Uh, so what we have like the, the name of the family is a keyword, so you can filter for that, and then also you can one of the facets is the source. So and the one of the sources is Clarence source family, so you can just check Clarence source families and then it shows you everything from the Clarence source families. And only that. I just uh, super, super quickly, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up. I just shared um, in the chat um, a very, very easy and uh, I think easy to use, a quite intuitive uh, um, small tool that we developed to, um, let's say, encourage uh, researchers to think of their workflows as uh, in these terms, right? Into steps that do something with their data. So you are welcome to. Uh, experiment with your own workflow um, and to try to build it, your workflow in terms of modules and steps so that do something with your data and see how um, uh, easy or challenging that becomes uh, even if uh, even with just a very small uh, workflow and if you have any questions or you want to follow up or discuss your workflow at any point I'm always available uh, for a chat thank you um, I will just uh, leave you Barbara leave it to it to you <laughs> 
Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I uh, also just wanted to ask a, a stupid question, but uh, when we talk about being uh, the resource families being available in the marketplace, talking about the whole resource family, say historical corpora, but not individ the individual elements of it, or both? No, that's a question for Alex. Alex. Sorry, uh, sorry, I was uh, distracted for so a if moment. I, <laughs> if I want to link the resource family from the mm -hmm. marketplace, yes, can I link to the whole resource family? Say, uh, the, the no, family of Anatolia Copra or individual? Uh, you can items only in link it? to individual items, yeah, but not to the whole okay. thing. So that's, that, that means that if we want to create a high level workflow, where I'd say, yeah, we that can one requires yeah. you an annotated historical corpus we can probably add not. we could probably also add yeah. whole families as separate items but that we would have to do by hand i think but that's what i meant yeah because yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, if you want to link to something that is historical corpora and not just a specific historical corpus that at the moment not possible but i'm sure we can discuss it i mean uh, within the editorial board we can can think of it it's i mean it's like there's like how many resource families at the moment 20 something so it's not a lot of work to put them in there manually like the families themselves because like it, it means so for instance it, it means like the resource family becomes a resource in itself and it can be version so you can see how it evolves as well uh, and it has a handle and everything so that's that's what we meant so I, it wasn't the individual resources so it's not uh, okay. like in, in the workflow we want to link to every single historical mm. Corpus or every single annotated corpus we want to refer to this resource which is a resource this type of resource yeah, yeah okay but then it depends on what you're doing right sometimes you only want to point to a specific a specific item because i guess both work... would be needed right yeah exactly yeah yeah exactly in our case it's specifically we want mm -hmm. to refer with a link with a handle to a resource family so we want to refer okay. to historical corpus so we want to say in this okay. step, in this workflow in this step we uh you need uh, there's a link to historical corpora so uh, as also katrine uh, asked it before if you click on it then you get the latest version uh, or you get to access all the historical corpora that have been uh, recently or that are that are available in that moment uh so that's what i meant so that's why mm -hmm. i was kind of puzzled because we can't actually at the moment we can't link to a resource family we can only yes. link to the elements individuals in the resource family yeah the only only thing i think the only thing you could link to is the web page that has a resource family that's the only thing at the moment that i could think of but yeah we can we can make something a bit more like proper <laughs> than that it wouldn't be very fair if it was just like a web page <laughs> yeah i agree it's not very fair I think there are more than good reasons, one good reason to, to give um, the whole resource family is a persistent identifier. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, very nice that we have this discussion, but maybe I guess we, maybe that, mm. we can maybe use it to use the virtual collection registry. Or the virtual, an, uh, an obvious place, it. maybe, because then you get a handle for free and you have to do anything Indeed. and you can version there. So that's probably a good idea. I think Katrine wanted to add something, maybe. Yeah, uh, when I, uh, when a couple of things, when I, uh, uh, when I uh, inscribe, subscribe to attend this meeting, if I think of a language resource family, I think of one typical resource, all similar, a corpus, a lexicon, etc. So the idea of having this under, uh, in another place as workflow to do, uh, as workflow in this marketplace, I think is a nice idea. I think if we talk, talk about workflows, there's uh, uh, two types of workflows. There's, there's a tool chain, data in, data out, data in, data out, data in, data out. That is nice because that's really extremely technical. And this is the term workflow. It's more like a cookbook with uh, recipes and tools and uh, the order of doing things and finding things uh, you need, your shopping list, etc. And this on an abstract level makes it workflows in the terms I think we are discussing here. And that, and then uh, there's not, uh, um, there, there's, they're separate from then uh, the workflows in the, in the real technical uh, way and the more detailed way and the workflows in the steps you have to take uh, and uh, the how to's really. So I think, uh, and I, I would say that this marketplace would be a good thing. And then it doesn't really um, uh, uh, clashes with uh, what is uh, elsewhere in the infrastructure because it's 
on a higher level than just pure tech technically data in and data out. And as for uh, uh, what I would like as a language resource <laughs> for this type of uh, 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 type of research is semantically annotated diachronic corpora. That would be a nice language resource for historical, uh, 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 historical semcor or something like uh, that, and not, uh, and that would be something completely different. But that's that was what I wanted to to comment. comment. Maybe very quickly, just for a reaction in Claren, we we have uh, seen other efforts such as the parliament uh, project that uh, some of you may be aware of, uh, where people who had the resources that were more or less similar, but they wanted them to be really harmonized, uh, uh, have come together and worked together with the support of Clarin. So should the, uh, the community have uh, the same uh, idea, uh, Clarin would be really happy to, to support. So well, yeah, I mean, we've been um, working on, um experiments of word center integration for, for Latin, for example. Uh, and so definitely on the case, <laughs> the case uh, there also a historical English and um, other people are, have been working on these. It's just, uh, of course, very, very difficult. Yes, it's very difficult, okay. but we, have, we are involved in a parliament project. And the nice thing uh, eventually for like the parliament project that you have all these parliamentary data in the same format uh, with the same uh, type of annotation, which is a fantastic resource. We would like to do this with Bibles as well, as some kind of uh, biblical resources and all these translations and uh, aligned with verses, etc. So you could think of something like for historical, for diachronic research, uh, some kind of research as well, but then you need to decide on the sense inventory, uh, which is common for our languages, etc. So it would be a very nice, very huge project. But in any case, uh, I was that was my first idea when I saw the title. Oh, would they be trying to do this? And I like the other. I like what you presented as well, but it's something completely different. Uh, so, uh, but I, I so today. Uh, Martin Wynn, who is the national coordinator for Clarin UK, could not be here, I think, because he's uh, at uh, another conference uh, where the, he also um, uh, attended on behalf of Clarin. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, he is cooking up some plans uh, about uh, the historical varieties, uh, so the historical languages of, uh, of the Britain and Ireland. So maybe the Clarin UK <laughs> team could take the lead there and then extend it to, to other corpora, but this is just a suggestion. Huh? Yeah, and I could just briefly add that the online ancient Greek and Latin, and Latin there's, uh, there's the work on, on the WordNet, and uh, you know, for example, with Andrea Farina will be presenting some annotation, semantic annotation of, um, of uh, uh, Latin, um, in ancient Greek, uh, and so yeah, so more more of this <laughs> uh, to come. Uh, okay, uh, Francesca, do you, do you want to have a few more points before closing? Uh, I have no. If there are no other um, additions to uh, to the discussion, I will just uh, you know go in towards uh, closing. Uh, no, just a second, I'm sharing my screen again. You should be now seeing my the slides. So uh, just a few words. Uh, thanks again to Barbara and uh, the organizers today for not only for the cafe, but also for the work that was behind uh, that. Um, I, I think that you should have received today the notification that uh, also uh, your work should be will be featured at uh, the Clarion conference, and, uh, and then we will work together uh, to see how these workflows uh, can be featured uh, appropriately uh, in uh, within Clarion, and uh, maybe other interesting developments such as the ones that we've just discussed uh, will uh, uh, stem out of of, of this work. Um, 
for all those who have uh, also asked me in the chat how to get in touch with Clarin and to, how to stay tuned with what we do, uh, you, I encourage all those who haven't uh, done it yet to join the uh, Clarin uh, News Flash uh, to stay up updated with uh, our news, uh, to check out our events, both um, Face to face and uh, online, and also uh, not apart from the Resource Families Project, we have uh, a series of other um, uh, funding uh, um, calls that are open. For instance, uh, also to uh, mobility calls that allow you to move to to visit uh, other knowledge centers. Uh, uh, and maybe then also uh, work with people who are knowledgeable in uh, uh, topics such as uh, these. And uh, so we are planning uh, uh, maybe another Clarin Cafe for, by the end of the year. Um, it is possible that this will feature training. And I know that Juliana van der Leck, our training officer, is here also listening. Uh, I think training is also another aspect that is quite important to Clarin. And maybe these workflows could be used in, in training indeed. So it is not uh, yet uh, out so the next uh, the call for the next cafe but uh, follow uh, the the links here in the in in uh, in the slides to know more about it. I think uh, uh, Elisa is putting all the relevant links also in the chat. And uh, I think that's uh, that's all for today. Thanks again uh, to the organizers and uh, and see you soon to for the next cafe.